All right, so with hepatitis, we're only gonna focus on the three most popular types of hepatitis in this country, and that's A, B, and C. So you need to know how they're transmitted and um, you know which ones have vaccines, et cetera. So hep A, this is a slow onset. So somebody's gonna eat some uh, raw shrimp or raw clams or oysters and come down with hepatitis A, within a couple of weeks, okay? It's, it's spread by fecal oral and contaminated uh, uh, food. So um, usually contaminated water or milk or fruits or vegetables, uncooked shellfish, and then poorly washed utensils. So people that aren't, um, you know, don't clean their dishes between eating. Um, and then prevention, of course, is gonna be hand washing especially after using the restroom. Um, drink bottled water when you're traveling and don't eat fresh fruits and vegetables when you're traveling. Um, practice safe sex even with um, hep A. Um, and you don't need to avoid alcohol to prevent any of these hepa uh, hepatitis um, variants. But after you get it, you will need to avoid ETOH, okay? So A has a vaccine. Um, it has immunoglobulins, so they can get it up to two weeks post if they're exposed. And also before, like somebody goes to a country where this is prevalent, they can, they can certainly get that as well. Once you get it, you have lifelong immunity with A and B, okay? There's no medications to treat it. It usually runs its course and you're done with it. Um, doesn't result in liver cancer like B and C can. Now your assessment findings are going to be the same in all types of hepatitis, which makes it easy. So with um, hep A, or I should say all of them, you're gonna have abdominal pain and it makes sense that the pain is probably gonna be felt in the right upper quadrant because the liver is gonna be inflamed. The skin will become jaundice and the sclera will become yellow and that's called icterus. They're gonna have joint muscle pain, um, GI symptoms, um, they'll have dark, foamy, or frothy urine in clay-colored or white stools. Fever is expected, high, even like 101. Um, nausea and vomiting, I talked about itchiness. They'll have itchiness because the bile salts, when the liver gets inflamed, are going to leak into the blood system and get under the skin. Um, clay-colored stools, and look for um, abrasions on their skin from scratching too hard. So they're going to have elevated... Uh, ALT, AST, those are the troponins, so to speak, of the liver. So they're going to be released anytime the liver's under stress. Bilirubin will be high and elevated or normal alkaline phosphate. So the alkaline phosphate is usually elevated in conditions where there's obstruction. So that could be elevated or not. Um, anybody that has had hepatitis that's recovering or during hepatitis, they need to eat high carbs and calories moderate fat and protein, small frequent meals. Now they're gonna have anorexia because they're just not gonna feel well. They cannot drink alcohol and some providers make them wait a year until after they're healed before they can, either, before they can even have any alcohol. Um, they'll need high caloric snacks, make sure they're having their vitamins. And then all types of hepatitis also have to, you know, you know, have rest periods and, you know, they have to um, address their fatigue. And then the other interventions, no sex for any type of hepatitis until the um, serological tests come back negative, until it's shown that you don't have the hepatitis anymore. Um, do not share any personal items like towels or drinking utensils, combs, brushes. Um, don't prepare food for the family. If you have the hepatitis, no alcohol, and watch over-the-counter medications, especially acetaminophen when we're talking about the liver, okay? Um, and then with B, the thing about B is this is can take up to six months to incubate, so they may not even realize how they got it, um, and it's due to blood and body fluid although not in urine and feces. So you don't have to worry about it in urine and feces. So it's saliva and semen. 
Um, also infected blood products and needles. Um, organ transplants, that's another reason. Same, and you can just kind of put B and C in the same category, so to speak, okay? So safe sex, um, needle precautions, you know, in our country, we um, screen all the blood before they get it. Okay, vaccine for B, no for C. Uh, immunoglobin is given for B, but not for C. We don't have one for C, I should say. Um, so once somebody gets A and B, they're going to be immune for the rest of their lives. If they, with B, most people are able to clear the virus on their own. And if not, they do have antiviral medication they can take. If they develop the cancer, the, the chronic form, they, they may develop um, cancer of the liver. All right. And that's the assessment findings, lab work, all that is all the same for all types of hepatitis. So mainly it's about the transmission um, that you need to know in which ones have vaccines, in which ones have the immunoglobulin, um, and how to prevent it. Okay, with cirrhosis, okay, this is kind of busy. I have another one too, if this is too busy for you, just hang on. So this is a multi-system disease and it is going to affect every area of the body. And you're gonna to have to know the symptoms and what we do about them. Um, and this is, I'm just gonna talk about end stage. You know, cirrhosis develops over the course of 30 years, say, right? And it, it, at first it's manageable. They don't even know they have it. And then, you know, they suddenly have like end stage. That's what you're going to be tested on, what to do in end stage and the symptoms you're going to see in end stage cirrhosis. So we'll start with neurological findings. Ammonia is neurotoxic. And this is the reason why they have a lot of the symptoms um, in the body, because the liver can't clear the urea in the body. It turns to pneumonia. Anyway, so they have a high ammonia level. So they're going to have the reversal of their sleep-wake schedule. They're going to have hand tremors or flapping. Asterisks is a wrist flapping or hand flapping. You have the patient extend their arm and you'll see the liver flapping. I have a video somewhere of that too. Um, inability to concentrate. So they have to read like the same thing over and over again. They're going to be, be confused, lethargic. Their they're, um, family like notices that they don't enjoy like games anymore or like they can't play chess anymore. So those are some of the things that may happen to them. They also develop um, peripheral nerve paresthesias. So they have like a neuropathy. So for the neurological findings, patients are usually prescribed a low protein diet to prevent the confusion. And they are put on lactulose and usually they're put on lactulose early um, you should see two to three soft bowel movements a day, but often we see more than that in the hospital. It helps remove the pH from the bowel and decreases the ammonia production. All right. So if somebody has known cirrhosis and they have a change in their mental status, you are going to compare it to their baseline. Hopefully you've taken care of them before. You're going to maybe read through the chart and find out what their um, baseline is. And then... Um, Check an O2 satin blood sugar because those are easy fixes. And often um, people have confusion because of low blood sugar or hypoxemia. Take their vitals, obviously, and then call to get an ammonia level drawn. And then ask the patient to extend their arm and look for that liver flap, the asterisks, um, to check to see if they are developing encephalopathy. Now, the reason that you want to identify this and get them on the lactulose and the low protein diet is because the encephalopathy can go this like four stages, right? And just because you're in stage four doesn't mean you can't go back to stage one. So we kind of want to get them back to their, um, their baseline. Some people with end stage um, cirrhosis are going to kind of talk like they're drunk, even though they haven't been drinking, they can slur their speech. So that's like another symptom. Okay. Now the GI findings that you're going to find in somebody with end stage cirrhosis, because they're so bloated, so to speak, they're going to be anorexic. They'll have hemorrhoids and that's from portal systemic hypertension. 
they're going to have pain in the right upper quadrant, um, clay colored stools, and that's due to obstruction of the liver calculi. Um, and then varices, they, and that's a big deal. Varices bleeding are going to be a big deal on your exams, and you get tested on that a lot. Um, they're going to have malnutrition and feta. Feta is musty breath. The splenomegaly, they develop from the portal hypertension, and they're going to have clay-colored stools and maybe diarrhea and nausea. All right. So, again, we're going to give the low diet, protein diet, soft foods. They have to be soft. This is to prevent them from bleeding from the varices. So you don't want them eating like chips or potato, popcorn or anything like uh, burnt toast, something like that. You don't want them eating hard food. It, you know, they need to be on a low sodium diet because of the ascites and they're going to need small, frequent meals. The endocrine findings, um, their body can't get rid of the hormones because the liver can't break them down. So they're going to have increased aldosterone. So they're going to have increased sodium and a decreased potassium. They're going to have increased ADH, which means they hold on to fluid. So that can exacerbate their ascites, etc. But the biggest um, symptom you'll probably see is they have increased circulation of estrogen. So they have, they can have like hot flashes, but they have like red palms. Um, they have spider angiomas. Men can have gynomastica and then they'll have sexual problems as well. All right. And then with the renal findings, hepatorenal syndrome happens at the end is when they both have liver failure and renal failure and we're going to talk about renal failure for the third exam um, for right now just know that this is like end stage when they get there um, they will have an increased bilirubin and um, the other thing you're going to monitor for is fluid and electrolyte findings so they're going to have a relative hypovolemic state that's what they'll be in so look for that low blood pressure um, tachycardia, high respiratory rate, narrow pulse pressure. All right, so um, the dermatological findings include jaundice. They are going to have extreme itching skin, so they're going to see scratches. I have some pictures of it too. Pubic hair changes we talked about. Caput medusa, I have some pictures of that for you. The spider angiomas and the palmar erythema from the estrogen. Echimocosis and petechiae, purpura. This happens because the liver normally makes our clotting factors and it makes the vitamin K dependent clotting factors. So our patients are going to be at high risk for bleeding. Also, when the spleen gets inflamed, it eats the thrombocytes. So they're going to be even more at risk for bleeding. Okay, so you're going to put them on bleeding precautions. And you would check a CBC with platelets and check their coagulation studies. And if they are bleeding, if they have a prolonged PTINR, you're going to give vitamin K or FFP. Now, remember, you give FFP in an emergency if they're bleeding. In vitamin K, you would give after FFP. All right. Now, the hematological findings include, and this is due to the splenomegaly that I'm talking about, anemia, thrombocytopenia. They'll also have leukopenia, which all leukopenia can is one of the reasons they can get spontaneous bacterial peritonitis. Now, remember with peritonitis, they could have like the board like abdomen, a fever. Um, so be watching out for that. And then um, impaired coagulation. So I talked about that. Um, so they're going to have a low albumin, which puts them at risk for infection. So they're going to be at risk for infection. Um, I talked about the decreased clotting factors, the cardiovascular symptoms. Okay, because they have portal hypertension, um, they're going to be at risk for the ascites. But the ascites is also going to make them um, have, have pulmonary findings. So because of where the ascites is, the proximity to the lungs, they could develop pleural effusions, and that can be quite uncomfortable for them. So they could become short of breath, hypoxemic, have dyspnea. So make sure you get the head of the bed up 30 degrees with the feet elevated to decrease the edema. Um, do daily weights to see how the fluid's doing, give, put O2 on them, 
and make sure you're assessing the respiratory status every four hours, four to eight hours. Um, and then if they do have bleeding varices, okay, you are going to have to manage that. So before they even get to that stage, hopefully they've been screened for varices and have had them either banded or ligated um, prophylactically. They're going to be put on a non-selective beta blocker to keep the blood pressure down in the portal system, um, treat all infections, but they can be given two medications, octreotide. Octreotide can be given to somebody with coronary artery disease. Vasopressin cannot, and it could exacerbate coronary artery disease. So monitor for ST changes. You will see those before you see dysrhythmias. Monitor for chest pain and a headache, okay? They're going to need endoscopic treatment if they're actively bleeding. Make sure you have your suction set up ready to go. Because if they start bleeding, you need to be able to suction their airway. You've got to protect that airway. Um, make sure I'm going to talk on another um, page about the balloon tamponade with the esophagastric balloon tube and the nursing implications of that. Um, they may need blood products. And you're going to monitor their respiratory status, you know, when they're bleeding and of suction their airway, but also their neurostatus because when somebody swallows blood, it gets absorbed as protein. The body digests it as protein and their BUN level is going to go up. This BUN level, they cannot, you know, is going to end up with high pneumonia and not pneumonia, high ammonia, okay, because they can't convert it. And what's going to happen is then they're going to get encephalopathic. That's why you have to watch the neurostatus. Um, and then administer your lactulose. Oh, here's the Sensake and Blakemore tube. Okay, stay with your patient if they have it. Maintain a patent airway. And that's the most important because that balloon can migrate up and occlude the airway. Keep scissors in the room. If the airway gets occluded, you can cut the tube and the balloons will deflate. Never leave a balloon inflated greater than 12 hours. Um, and it's mostly about just watching the airway. And then they may do if some, if they suspect they have spontaneous bacterial um, peritonitis, they may do a paracentesis. They may also do a paracentesis because the ascites is quite uncomfortable and it will come back, but it may offer some temporary relief for patients with cirrhosis. So nursing implications, obviously it's an invasive procedure. You're gonna need an informed consent. Uh, weigh the patient before and after the procedure because you wanna you know, see if the amount of fluid taken off matches the weight. Um, place the patient supine with the head of the bed elevated. Extremely important to have the patient urinate before the test to decrease the risk of a bladder perforation, all right? Um, and they have to stay still during the procedure. And then during the paracentesis, you're gonna take the vital signs um, and then watch for hypovolemic shock. Now, if they're gonna put a collecting bag in, um, sometimes they do that like a permanent bag or a temporary collection bag, if they start, if their blood pressure starts going down, they're getting tachycardic and you think that they're going into shock, you can just, um, it, those are set to gravity, just pull it up so the, um, the ascites doesn't drain anymore, okay? Um, monitor for shock after, put a little dressing over the puncture site, and then bed rest as prescribed after. You're going to look for that low urine output um, and then weigh your patient and do the post-procedural vital signs. And measure for peritonitis for 48 hours after. All right. Um, liver transplant. Now, some patients, hepatitis C is the um, biggest reason, not biggest, largest, the most common reason people get liver transplant. Okay. So you have to know who wouldn't qualify. And there's people with um, end stage disease like end stage CAD or end stage COPD. They have to be able to take care of themselves. They can't have like psychiatric problems. Um, they have to be able to follow directions exactly and self-manage themselves. This is kind of changing active AUD or SUD. Some, some places are allowing liver transplants for 
patients who are still actively using. Um, and then about the immunosuppressive medications, make sure you're telling them to avoid crowds and sick people. They need to report signs and symptoms of infection right away. Um, the side effects of these medications could include hypertension, hyperglycemia, uh, nephrotoxicity, and GI disturbances. But uh, one of the most devastating sign, um, things that can happen when somebody's on immunosuppressive drugs is they could develop a cancer, right? Because the cells in the body aren't, are seeking out those cells and killing them early. All right, so make sure you're teaching your patient to do breast self-exam, testicular self-exams, etc. cetera. Um, let me see. Um, then with rejection, you're going to look for tachycardia. This is like day four to 10, pain in the right upper quadrant, a fever, um, diminished bile drainage if they have a T-tube. And then you're going to see like increased jaundice. So just think about this. If the liver is failing, you're going to see signs of liver failure, right? You're going to see increased LFTs, increased bilirubin, and prolonged PT. The patient will, might get jaundice again. Now, these are the labs you're going to see in, um, in people with liver failure. Now, we do pancreatitis as well. And um, students often get confused when after I talk about pancreatitis, which labs? These are the labs just for liver. Okay, ooh, let's cap it Medusa right here. All right, so early on in cirrhosis, the, L, the ALT and the AST will be elevated. There comes a time when the liver becomes really fibrotic and they can't release, the cells can't release these enzymes anymore. So that might be normal. ALP is if there's an obstruction. Billy Rubin is also going to be high, and this is what makes people itch like crazy. Ammonia will be high. Um, PT and INR will be prolonged. Protein in albumin is going to be low because the liver is what makes albumin. And if somebody has end-stage liver disease, they're never going to make albumin. Okay? So you don't treat, you treat, you still give them a low-protein diet. You don't increase protein in the diet. Um, platelets will be low, hemoglobin, um, glucose could be high or low, and then the white count is going to be low because of the spleen's Pac-Man abilities. All right, again, cirrhosis, it occurs over a number of years and people often don't know they have it. The main cause in this country is hepatitis C, but it can also occur for somebody that drinks too much. So some of the um, side effects, or I should say adverse effects of uh, late stage liver disease include portal systemic encephalopathy. So um, you have to do a nervous system assessment. And this is due, the reason they get these symptoms is because of the ammonia buildup in the blood. And ammonia is neurotoxic, all right? So the normal level of pneumonia is 10 to 80. So if it's, you expect it to be high, um, lethargy and fatigue, asterisk. See how this is like the arm is extended and the hand is flapping. Slurred speech, even when they're not drinking, they can have slurred speech. Loss of concentration, mental status, sleeping all day, being awake all night. They can have a, re a Bibinski reflex, which is usually only seen in babies, um, peripheral neuropathy, and hand tremors. Fetter is that bad, musty breath. That's another thing that can happen when they have PSE. Okay, because the society is so big, they're going to have trouble breathing, and they can develop pleural effusions. In the GI assessment, they're going to have van, vomiting, anorexia, and nausea. I talked about the splenomegaly, eating up all the blood cells, all the types of blood cells. Um, early on, they're going to have hepatomegaly. And then as the disease um, progresses, it's going to be smaller. It's going to be fibrotic and shrink. Um, they'll have hemorrhoids from the portal systemic, um, um, hypertension, and clay-colored stools. The fetter is that musty breath. 
And then the endocrine assessment, I talked about the um, estrogen. So this is what Palmer erythema looks like. And this is what spider angiomas look like. The pubic hair changes we talked about in class, gynomastica and sexual problems and infertility. And with the skin, this is icterus. This is jaundice of the eye essentially. And you can see that the skin here is jaundice. Um, poor skin turgor because the fluid is like in the third space. So they have like a relative hypovolemia. Um, they'll have purpura and this is due to their bleeding tendencies. These are the excoriations. This is what you can see on somebody who has um, bile salts under their skin. It gets so itchy. Um, and this is bruising. Here's spider angioma again. And monitor the CBC with platelets and coagulation studies for anybody that shows like the bruising, the purpura, the petechiae. Okay. Hematologically, I talked about the spleen getting enlarged due to the portal hypertension. It becomes then like a Pac-Man. It eats the white blood cells, it eats the platelets, and it eats the red blood cells. So expect, you know, risk of injury. So that you want them on bleeding precautions. And then they may become short of breath, orthostatic, and have fatigue because of the anemia and because of their big belly. Okay, they are going to have low protein blood levels, but you're still going to keep them on a low protein diet. They'll have better sinus tachycardia, weight loss, despite all, despite all the fluid being on board, right? They have muscle wasting, so their legs are going to be really skinny, and then they're going to have ascites, okay, in their belly. So I always think of that martini olive look. Here are the labs again, same as the last page, okay? So the ones in pink are going to be high and the ones in blue are going to be low. So don't get them mixed up. Um, and then liver biopsy, biopsy, they may do a liver biopsy to see if they do have cirrhosis. So no food or drink for four hours. Get a consent, do a timeout. Um, they're going to need coagulation studies and platelets um, before the procedure. They will need to get those labs done. And then they're going to have to hold their breath while the provider performing the biopsy actually sticks the big trocar in. All right. But what you're going to do after is put the patient on the right side because they're going to be high risk for bleeding and you want to tamponade that bleeding. All right. And then look for those signs of shock that you know so well. All right. Some other um, interventions we're going to do. We're going to put the head of bed up maybe the feet up a little bit if they're, they have edema. They're going to be put on a low sodium diet. They're going to eat soft foods um, and make sure there are low protein soft foods. And you want to do daily weights, abdominal girths, and um, they may be taking vitamins. They should be taking vitamins, I should say. Skin care, don't use harsh soap. They should wear, you could put cotton gloves on them. You know, we're not, we're not really supposed to put restraints on if they're um, scratching themselves and clip their nails. Put them on bleeding precautions and use tepid water. All right, end-stage liver disease, same, same stuff. They may be on a fluid restriction, definitely cannot drink alcohol. And this is just showing you portal hypertension, and we've, we've talked about all these conditions that can happen with portal hypertension. Okay, so everybody needs to be screened for varices in endoscopy. Now endoscopy is used for screening, but it is also used if somebody is bleeding from varices to either sclerose or um, ligate the varices. Okay, so every patient needs to be screened. They'll be put on beta blockers. Um, Treat all infections aggressively because that can increase bleeding. Remember, octreotide is the medication you can give to patients with CAD. Vasopressin, you do not monitor for the ST changes. This is just showing you what this is banding of varices and a lig you know, a ligation. They may have that as well. This is that Sensakin Blakemore tube. Here's the balloon. Sometimes they put it on a football helmet to keep it secure. All right. So
So this is tips. I wouldn't worry about tips. That's like a um, last. That's like if all uh, everything else fails, they would do that. So somebody that's bleeding, right? They're going to need packed red blood cells, maybe FFP and platelets. Um, they're going to need uh, if they're bleeding, you're going to put put them on. Make sure they're taking the lactulose so that they don't get encephalopathy from swallowing all that blood. Um, the other drugs they can also give cap a vancomycin capsules to clean out the bowel. Um, in uh, flagell as well, and neomycin too. Um, okay, I talked about the Sensate and Blakemore tube, never inflate more than 12 hours, cut the balloon if the patient is in distress. Vasopressin, we talked about the ST segments, we're gonna look for that, because you'll see that before dysrhythmias, monitor for the chest pain. Uh, I talked about octreotide, um, endoscopy treatments for the hemorrhage is what they're going to do. They don't get rushed to the OR, they get rushed to endoscopy. Um, portal systemic hypertension, uh, encephalopathy. So this is, again, hand tremors, asterisks, inability to concentrate, reversal of sleep-wake. Also, their emotions can be all over the place. They can be happy one minute, sad the next, very inappropriate as, as well at some times. So if your patient does have a change in LOC, all right, remember, check the blood sugar, check the O2 sat. Remember, always assess first, if, unless the patient's really in distress. Call the provider, you're gonna need to get an ammonia level and um, ask them to extend their arms and hands so you can check for uh, wrist flapping. Okay, transplants. Okay, I already talked about this. End stage COPD, um, people with cancer, metastatic disease, cognitive decline, severe cardiac disease um, are not candidates. Um, this is the patient teaching for immunosuppressive drugs, so avoid crowds and infected people. They need to report the signs and symptoms immediately. This is what those drugs can cause but they can also cause malignancy. So you need to be um, have the patient under some type of surveillance for that. All right, because that's concerning. You can't really like, if somebody is immunosuppressed, it's gonna be very difficult to treat that. All right, hep C is the most common reason people do get a transplant. So it's not a reason not to get a transplant. Again, reject rejection, fever, tachycardia, four to 10 days pain in the right upper quadrant. Now, this is a T-tube, okay? If they have one, it this is this um, drains bile, okay? So if you have decreased drainage, it lets you know that the liver may be rejecting. Um, and then look for the increased blood studies and a return to liver failure. Okay, trauma to the liver. You guys are going to be pros about this. Um, remember, your liver receives 1,500 milliliters per minute. So that just shows you it's highly vascular. So if somebody has an MVA and they have a liver laceration, they could bleed out quickly. So look for signs of decreased perfusion. Sinus tachycardia first. Thirst. They may be asking for more to drink. Um, increased respiratory rate. The one that students usually forget is the narrow pulse pressure because the systolic and diastolic pressure are closer together, okay? Um, dizziness in the bed, um, thirst, lightheadedness, tachypnea, yep. Algoria, look for that. Cursine, so cursine is a referred pain and it's pain in the shoulder. If your cursine is on the right side, there's a good possibility that something is wrong with the liver. If it's on the left side, the spleen may have ruptured. So that's called Kerr sign. Okay, now pancreatitis. Pancreatitis is one of those things that, you know, patients may have a mild case or they can be really sick and in the unit, okay? So it can be life-threatening. Um, basically what happens, there's a trigger, okay? And there's all these cute mnemonics out there about like what causes pancreatitis. You really only need to know, know two things. 
it's either alcohol or it's biliary obstruction. Okay, those are the two things you're going to be tested on. So something triggers the pancreas to auto digest itself, like somebody drinks too much. And so the, it triggers the pancreas to release enzymes that then auto digest the pancreas. Okay. So it, if that keeps happening, they're going to get the chronic form. So you want to try to nip this in the bud. So basically, I mean, you don't have to know like which enzyme does what. Okay. But they're going to have localized hemorrhage in that area, but you also have to look out for hypovolemic shock, okay? Fat necrosis um, is going to cause a low calcium and low magnesium level, but you don't have to really know it's from fat necrosis. Um, and then also shock, okay? Because they get leaky capillaries, just to put it that way. So the most common reasons that you need to know about is biliary obstruction and ETOH. Okay. And if somebody has biliary obstruction, the way you know the difference, okay, bit with biliary obstruction, they're going to have elevated LFTs along with the labs we're going to talk about in pancreatitis. All right. So with the pain assessment, remember how to do your PQRST, but patients that come in with pancreatitis, I mean, the pain is horrendous. I mean, grown men crying like babies. It really is painful, truly is. Almost up there with um, renal calculi. So usually they have pain in the mid epigastric area and it radiates to the back. It can re radiate to the left flank or the left shoulder. The pain is described as boring and otherwise it's boring through them. Um, it's continuous, intense and boring, okay? And the patient's gonna guard the pain. Now, with acute pancreatitis pain, you expect it to wax and wane. So if somebody's pain is increasing and they have pancreatitis, I'm not upset about it, okay? I, I'm Because I expect that, okay? So the pain is made worse by lying down. So patients find relief by being in the fetal position, and the correct term for that is left, left, lateral decubitus because their knees are bent. Or they might want to sit upright and lean forward and bend their knees. Bending their knees seems to help. So make sure, but make sure, because the pain is pretty horrendous, you're taking care of A, B, C, D before pain um, and expect the pain to get worse. Okay. They're going to may get weight loss because they're not going to be able to eat. First of all, once they, you discover they have pancreatitis, they're going to be MPO to rest the pancreas so the enzymes don't keep leaking out and auto digesting. Okay, so you're, they may be they may have jaundice if they have biliary obstruction. They may end up with pleural effusion. So another condition that results in pleural effusions. They can also develop ARDS from pancreatitis. Um, they also develop these um, bruising kind of signs over the flanks right here. This is called gray Turner sign. Some books you might just see it here. It described as Turner Turner sign. And this represents retroperitoneal bleeding. Okay. So it's like a huge bruise. Makes sense. And then Cullen sign, which is around the umbilicus. This uh, represents intraperitoneal and retroperitoneal bleeding. Okay. So if your patient has one of these signs, okay, make sure you assess further because, yeah, if they have this, you might be upset about it. However, you are always going to be more concerned with someone's symptoms than a sign. Yes, he has Gray Turner sign or he has Cullen sign, but his vital signs are normal. I'm not waking a provider up in the middle of the night to tell them that because it's expected with pancreatitis. If they have symptoms of shock, yes, then you would be concerned. Your abdominal inspection. Remember the order of abdominal um, assessment. Okay, you're going to expect the abdomen first. You're going to auscultate. Now, their uh, bowel sounds may be decreased or absent because they may develop a paralytic ileus. So if they pass flatus or having a BM, this is the best indicator for the return to peristalsis. If they have that, they don't need an NG tube. However, 
if they develop a paralytic ileus, they will need an NG tube. Um, they can get parapancreatic uh, ascites in that area, and then they could have some uh, rigidity. That's not that important, but they will have tenderness in guarding. Okay, so that's kind of important to know that they would guard like that, but know the normal sequence of abdominal uh, assessment. So you want to inspect, you want to auscultate, you want to percuss, and then you palpate last. All right, here are the labs. Now you're going to need to know this. Amylase. Amylase is a pancreatic enzyme. It's going to be increased um, with people with pancreatitis. However, it goes back down after two to three days. Lipase is also going to be increased. And this is the most sensitive because it stays elevated for seven to 10 days. So for example, sometimes men are stubborn or sometimes, you know, I've had taken care of people with pancreatitis and they, they're in misery for three days before they come to the hospital. So their amylase may be normal, but their lipase will still be elevated. Okay. So that's a, like a clue. Alkaline phosphate will be elevated for somebody that has biliary obstruction. Um, bilirubin, this will be elevated with obstruction. And ALT, again, they're gonna, it's going to be elevated with obstruction. Um, WBCs are going to be high because it's inflammation. BUN is going to be high because um, they're going to be hemoconcentrated. They're going to be a little dehydrated. Uh, glucose, okay, so typically it's normal. However, because it's the pancreas, and remember the pancreas has that insulin function, they could end up with hyperglycemia. And when we, we talk about chronic pancreatitis, they can develop diabetes, diabetes one as an adult with chronic pancreatitis. Um, the inflammatory markers will be present. I just talked about the magnesium being low. Um, albumin will be low. Platelets may be low. Uh, Prealbumin, this will be low. The normal is 15 to 16. You don't have to memorize lab values anymore. But prealbumin is the best test to test somebody for malnutrition because it, it tests for the like last three days. It lets you know that somebody's had poor nutrition for the last three days. Calcium is going to be low and that can be a problem because they're going to be at risk for ventricular tachycardia, um, a certain variant of ventricular tachycardia. And I'm going to show you what that looks like in a minute. Um, triglycerides will be high. Okay, so your interventions, your priorities, you want to do a respiratory assessment because they're going to have trouble breathing because of the pain. They're going to have, they may have pleural effusions and they may develop ARDS. So you're going to do the respiratory um, assessment. Then in your C category, you want to do the fluid resuscitation. That's going to be a very important intervention, more so than taking care of pain. Okay, I, I mean, I don't, Want, want to seem like I don't care about pain, but I really care about the blood pressure more than the pain. Um, and you want to anticipate and treat any complications. So make sure you're listening to Lung Sounds Q4. Um, make sure you're, you know, checking the O2 SAT. Um, control pain um, by interventions that decrease GI tract activity, which means the patient's going to be kept MPO. That decreases the pain. OK, also, they're going to be on bed rest because when they get up and walk around, that increases metabolism, which increases the pain of pancreatitis. They're going to need um, morphine or Dilaudid. They'll need antiemetics. Um, NG tube only if they don't have flatus or about uh, if they have no flatus or no bowel movement. So in other words, if they have paralytic ileus, they need an NG tube. You're going to assess for signs of hypocalcemia. So circumoral tingling and a long QT on the EKG because of the fat necrosis, it, you don't really need to know that they're going to have a low calcium level. Monitor for fluid overload. OK, listen for crackles um, and you want to see if, you know, if because you're going to have to differentiate cardiogenic pulmonary edema from non cardiogenic pulmonary edema. So, you know, if the pulmonary edema is for too much fluids, or are they developing ARDS, okay?
Um, and then this is what Torsad's day point looks like. This is a variant of VTAC and it's treated with magnesium. That's how that's treated. So if somebody has this and you're in a code, you're gonna treat with magnesium. You're not gonna give the other normal meds um, because it antagonizes the, um, it helps the heart when there's hypocalcemia, put it that way. All right, so look for the other signs of hypocalcemia as well. Okay, so again, you're gonna, they're gonna, patients are gonna be kept MPO early, okay, and they're ne gonna need fluid resuscitation, so IV fluids with saline or lactated ringers. They're gonna need antiemetics, PRN, I'll, I, IV fluid resuscitation again. All right, NG tube if they're not passing platus, um, and pain management. So the diet, when they start eating again, it's going to be small, frequent meals and snacks. Now, the most important thing is low fat, okay? They need to avoid alcohol and caffeine and no smoking. Smoking increases your the secretion of your digestive enzymes, so you can't let them smoke. Um, they may need, like, supplemental protein shakes, all right? And then chronic pancreatitis. Kind of the same signs and symptoms, couple of variants. Um, first of all, it's usually alcoholism that causes this because the patient will have episodes of acute pancreatitis over and over again, and finally it's chronic. The uh, organ is going to fibrose, so they're going to develop diabetes type 1. And you know it's highly unusual for an adult to develop diabetes type 1. Um, in malnutrition. So look at their pre-albumin or their albumin levels. So the assessment findings, um, they're going to have steatorrhea and they're going to have a lot of it, okay, unless it's controlled better. They're going to have unintentional weight loss and muscle um, wasting. They'll have jaundice, dark foamy stool, and look for the three P's of diabetes, okay. Now, they're going to have to take pancreatic enzymes, and this is for chronic pancreatitis only, so don't get turned around on exams. This is only for somebody with chronic pancreatitis, okay? So it's usually um, prescribed, and it's in a capsule form. If somebody can't swallow, you know, doesn't want to swallow, you can open that up and sprinkle it on food. They need to um, take it with all meals and snacks. You're going to put it in a carbohydrate food, not a protein food. Um, they need to follow up with a big glass of water. Teach them not to chew or crush the preparations, okay? And then um, the other thing is wipe their lips after taking the enzymes to avoid skin irritation. All right, dressing changes for central lines. Now, what's, what can happen if somebody has Q pancreatitis and they're not able to eat? They may get tube feeds, um, and they'll 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 get like a Dobhoff tube, which goes past the stomach down to the jejunum. Um, but they could also get TPN. Now, I don't know if I told you this before, but you never want to give TPN unless it's absolutely the last ditch effort to feed somebody because pancreatitis um, because TPN has a lot of adverse effects. Okay, so like you want to make sure you have to be meticulous about your um, care of the vascular device that it's being infused in and just basic care of the um, infusion as well. So just dressing changes on a central line are a sterile procedure. Um, every place I've worked, you had to wear, you had a full gear cap, mask, uh, goggles just to protect yourself, but you know, the gown, the, the sterile gloves and everything, okay? Um, monitor for infection. So when you're changing it, you're going to be looking for signs of infection because remember, the infection of a central line is probably going to start local at first, okay? So before it gets systemic and you see like a, you know, increase in white blood cell or like a, a fever, you're going to see local changes first. So make sure when you're in there, if there's any drainage or it looks bad, you culture it, okay? And make sure your dressing is occlusive. 
Um, and then um, the diet for pancreatitis, again, eat, they can't eat like spicy foods. It's got to be like bland. It's got to be low fat. It could be high protein, but the, the main thing is low fat because low, because fat is like what really stimulates the pancreas. Uh, nicotine, no smoking. Uh, avoid caffeinated like cola, tea, coffee, alcohol, high fat foods. Okay. Pancreatitis is uh, not pancreatitis, heart therapy. So that's the pancreatic enzymes is only for chronic pancreatitis. And anybody that has chronic pancreatitis or has pancreatitis and they're going home, they're going to be very weak. So they need to be on one floor. And if they do have chronic pancreatitis, usually they need to be in a room that they have either a bathroom or they have a commode because they may be sitting on the toilet a lot. So um, they need to rest frequently. And also you don't want them walking up and down stairs because that increases metabolism it could lead to an exacerbation. So report an increase in the frothy stools and fatty stools. And remember, they need to report the three Ps of DM if they didn't have diabetes uh, previously. All right, now pancre pancreatic cancer is very hard to treat because of where the pancreas is. Um, it's kind of a hidden organ and we don't see the signs and symptoms until it's quite progressed, okay? So it has low survival rates. Lots of different causes. You know, it happens the sixth to eighth decade of life. People smoke, people eat red meat. Um, males is more common in males. But the assessment findings you're going to find is the same findings you would find in anybody with biliary obstruction. So here is the icterus. They will be jaundice. They'll have that clay-colored stool, dark, foamy urine, paritis. Um, my husband's cousin had pancreatic cancer, and that was his first symptom. He was just itchy all the time, and he couldn't figure it out. And finally, he did some tests and found out he had pancreatic cancer. Excoriations. Um, pancreatic cancer is one of those thrombogenic cancers. So the patient could develop a DVT. And they could end up with a pulmonary embolism. So make sure you're watching out for that and watching out for calf pain. They're going to have, they could develop type 1 diabetes as an adult, um, which is unusual. They'll have early satiety because of where the pancreas is and the stomach is like on top of it. So the pancreas is impinging on the stomach. So that's another early symptom. They'll have extreme fatigue and gas. They'll have unintentional weight loss, which I know we all dream about that, but it's really good. So the labs that you're going to see, this is a tumor of the head of the pancreas right here, is increased liver enzymes in the LAP, the alkaline phosphate, but also the amylase and the lipase will be increased as well. And look for those cancer markers. Um, it'll be diagnosed with an ERCP. Um, and the treatment is going to be palliative, and they'll probably go in hospice care. Now, there is a procedure. It's one of my favorite surgeries. It's called a Whipple surgery, and it's a, it's a really big surgery, and it's palliative. However, it does make patients more comfortable in their last kind of years of life. Um, so with this surgery, um, Where's my picture of the surgery? Here's the Whipple surgery, okay? So you don't have to know, like, what they removed or anything. I just want to show you how it kind of ends up. You don't have to know, like, the configuration. I'm just trying to point out how they, how much, like, they move the water in them, okay? So, like, this is, and they move the end of the uh, stomach. So this is, like, a huge surgery. I love it because patients came to the PACU with, like, all these tubes. And I, when I worked in ICU, it was, it's fun when you get like a, a patient with a lot of like tubes and they're irritated and over the course of a couple of days, you can see like the tubes go away and see them waking up and getting better. So post-op care, they're going to definitely be cared for in the ICU. They would come to me in the PACU already in like this high, semi-high followers position to be intubated, okay? And the reason they're kept in this is to kind of decrease decreased tension on the anamosis, so that's where the suture lines are, so you want to keep them like that, 
and I don't know if you've been told this before, but if a, a patient has like a, a huge surgery, especially like on the stomach, you never remove that NG tube, you never advance it, you never, like basically your job is to make sure it's working. Because if something happens and it's not, you're gonna have to call the surgeon to come and, and manipulate it, okay? You should never manipulate it because you do not wanna pop one of these sutures. Monitor the urino. Obviously, you know what the normal urine output is because it's a big surge in you know, establishing fluid and electrolyte balances is going to be one of your main priorities. Um, the urine, I mean, the urine, they're going to have these JPs and they could have like four or five of them and they could be bile stained early for 24 hours. The complications are the same as any other operation you know with fluid electrolytes atelectasis so expect a low grade fever expect big by basal crackles on the first couple of days you know what to do if they're not invaded right you're going to get it to turn cough deep if you can send this barometer um remember that pancreatic cancer is a thrombogenic type of cancer so remember to watch out for your primary embolism after and ARDS is a possibility, okay, so that's non-cardiogenic pulmonary edema. You thought you were going to get away from it, huh? Um, and then look out for cardiovascular complications. It's surgery. They get a lot of fluid, so hopefully the heart can stand it. So you're going to look for you know, differentiate cardiogenic pulmonary edema from non-cardiogenic pulmonary edema. Um, check their electrolytes. That's going to be one of your priorities. Um, that was another thing. We had to do a lot of blood sugars after because they could get um, uh, hyperglycemia after. And then paraphilic ileus, they're going to come to you if they have a nipple with an NG tube. Make sure it's working. You want to keep the tension down on the suture line. And then if that eviscerates, you know, help stay with the patient, put normal saline gauze on it. Okay. You're going to be taking care of uh, liver patients that have a risk of bleeding. Also, if they come in with other risk of bleeding, and this is bleeding. So your neuro findings, if somebody has a brain bleed, right? a blown people on the same side as bleed, right? If they have um, low perfusion, okay, they could be apprehensive, could get irritable, they could have impending doom, they could have thirst, so they may be asking you more to drink, for more to drink, they may be asking you to fill up their water pitcher earlier than you would expect. They may have headaches, dizziness in the bed, um, seizures anytime there's a brain bleed. Um, and then cardiovascular signs. I talked about tachycardia being the first sign of low perfusion with a narrow pulse pressure. Dizzy in the bed is never good. They could have um, hypotension and orthostatic hypotension. So remember all those signs. Um, remember Cullen sign, Gray Turner sign, and Kerr sign. Kerr sign is the pain. The in the shoulders and if it's on the right it's the liver if it's on the left it's the spleen look for the signs of low urine output um and then high respiratory rate and tachypnea and cool clammy skin because hypovolemic shock is cold shock all right are you still with me